All right, well, I'm going to get going um, since it's noon, and I know these are short programs, so we'll, we'll get started right away. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Barbara Richter, and I'm the Executive Director at the New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commissions. And um, today's program is using online mappers for conservation of wildlife and other natural resources. And as we were just talking, um, it's a really great uh, source of data to help you identify and document and manage wildlife habitats or help with conservation plans, your NRI. Um, and so granted is a really um, almost the first stop, I think, when you're, when you're looking to do conservation planning or NRI or other uh, management, um, conservation management. So for those of you who might not know NHACC, we're a nonprofit organization working to support conservation commissions so that they can be successful in their communities protecting their local natural resources. And we provide education and assistance to 217 conservation commissions here in New Hampshire. And I'm very pleased to invite our two special guests here from UNH Co Cooperative Extension. We have Amanda Stone, who's the state specialist in natural resource conservation, and Wendy Scribner, who's the forest field specialist at uh, UNH. And just before we get started, I wanna give you a, a couple of uh, reminders here. I will be sending uh, the recording out and the links and additional links tomorrow um, as a follow-up to this program. Uh, we also ask that you all mute um, your audio so that we have good uh, audio quality for the whole group. And uh, if you could check your audio now and, and turn that turn the mute on, that'd be great. Uh, we will have some time for questions at the end of the program, uh, but so you can use the chat box to uh, type your questions in. That's at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, we also could probably use the um, reaction button. You can raise your hand. We'll see how it goes. I think we have a good amount of people, so we might have to just use the chat box, but feel free to raise your hand if you'd wanna speak, um, just ask your question live. So now I'd like to welcome Amanda and Wendy um, to guide us through these wonderful online mappers and they're gonna show us just how easy they are to use. So Amanda. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to I'm going to switch over to you for admitting people now. Uh, yep, um, I got it. So um, you got it. That's great. So uh, good to see you all. Um, and welcome to the session on online mappers. So Wendy and I are going to be taking you through this is it's a it's at an introductory level, but hopefully even if you're more experienced, you will learn something new as well. Uh, we're going to focus on wildlife habitats and water resources. Um, as some of the data layers we're looking at, because with limited time, we can't go into all the natural resources, but you'll actually see how it relates to a number of another, other natural resources that you'll be working with. Um, there are probably some of you here who can remember back to the time when we were all using paper maps and the wealth of data and information that we have available in Granite is something we could only have dreamed of back then. Uh, we didn't even have access to GIS when I started working here 33 years ago. So, um, there's, there's a lot of easily accessible data and information that you can use in your natural resources planning, your natural resources inventories, your conservation planning, um, and hopefully we will um, show you some new tools you may not have been aware of. We're going to focus primarily on Granite View and just do a quick dip into the aquatic restoration mapper and the very new New Hampshire Wildlife Corridors data. So um, I'm going to hand over to Wendy to get started. Um, and she's going to share her screen. And we're both going to be demonstrating the maps using the town of Tuftonboro. Um, I'm not sure if there's anybody from here from Tuftonboro today, but um, that's our example that we're using. Uh, so Wendy, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Now, um, are you seeing the Granite View screen? Awesome, great. Okay, um, well, welcome everyone. Um, just to start out, I've already logged into Granite View, but if you to access Granite View, just uh, Google Granite View, and you should be able to pick up the website that way. This is the start screen that you usually see with Granite View, and so the first thing that you're going to want to do is zoom into your area of interest, and so you can use these uh, plus keys to to move yourself in. There is also uh, a way to use these quick tools 
to zoom into a city or a town or a zip code. So as Amanda said, today we're gonna to be looking at Tuftonboro. So I can just type in Tuftonboro and I guess, I guess it is case sensitive. So, uh, so we'll just type that in and zoom directly into uh, that area of interest. So if you're, whatever community you're working with, you can, you can zoom into that area and then bookmark it so that you can get back there quickly each time you go to get back. We also just want to mention that the background here is Bing Roads, but you can also choose from aerial photographs as well. I'm going to leave it with the roads today, but, but just so that you know that that is an available feature there as your base map. So as Amanda said, you know, we've got a tremendous amount of information and what's great about Granite View is we can look at all of that information as different layers and we can turn different layers on and off to, to really focus in on whatever it is that we're particularly interested in. So I'm gonna go up to the menu and click on this view layers button and you can see a whole bunch of layers appear on the left-hand side of the screen. So today we're gonna to look at habitat data. So we're gonna come down to this environment and conservation menu here. I'm gonna click that checkbox and then you'll notice the little plus sign over on the far left. Anytime that says it has a plus in it, that means there are more drop down menus below. And so under environment and conservation, I'm gonna click on wildlife. And then I'm gonna click on Wildlife Action Plan. And we are gonna start off by looking at the Wildlife Action Plan Habitat Land Cover Map. And so again, this is the community of Tuftonboro here. So this gives us an idea of the different habitat types throughout the community of Tuftonboro. So starting at the north end of town, uh, you can see this orangish color here. If we go down through and, and look at all of these categories, this orange is northern hardwood conifer. The next one that we look at down here is this green color, which is hemlock hardwood pine. And then this brown, brown cover type is Appalachian oak pine. And so each one of these habitat types uh, has species of conservation concerns associated with them. I'm just going to show you, um, let's see, I think I have to figure out how to move that. There we go. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about that habitat type, you can go to the uh, Taking Action for Wildlife website and you can find information. These are habitat stewardship series which will give you information about uh, most of the major uh, forest types that we have, the species of conservation concern that are, are connected with those, as well as uh, some stewardship guidelines. So this can be great information for you to, to provide uh, to folks in your community uh, where they have these different habitat types. I'm gonna zoom in, whoops, wrong way. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here, and you can see all of these different uh, shades of blue. So uh, these are a number of different water features, uh, northern swamp, open water, peatlands. Uh, you can also see the purple up here, that sand and gravel. Uh, sorry, it's a little blurry. Um, it has been loading a little bit slow lately today. Some of these little orange patches are grassland habitats. So it gives us a good picture of the habitat distribution across the community of Tuftonboro. So the next thing that we may want to look at while this is, is uh, loading that habitat data layer is um, how do our town conservation lands and, and other conservation lands line up over this habitat type. So back over here in the different data layers, I'm gonna click on this conservation and public lands data layer. 
And here you can see in green all of the different conservation lands in Tufton Borough and how they relate to the different habitat types. This green solid color is a default. And unfortunately, it makes it challenging to see those different habitat types underneath. But we can go ahead and change the symbology by going to the conservation and public lands layer, clicking on that arrow, and then clicking on turn off and on layer visualizations. So that green is the default. We are going to create a custom layer. Um, we're going to have a solid line, but instead of having solid fill, we're going to put in a backward diagonal line. I'm going to apply that, and then we're done. So then we can zoom back in. And as we look at these different habitat types, actually, I need to zoom back out. And come down here a little bit. We're going to look specifically at this Cops Pond area here. So you can see the variety of habitats and where the protected lands are. So as most of you are probably um, aware and, and have seen these different habitat maps, I am going to shut off the habitat land cover layer. And we're going to take a look at the highest ranked habitats. Um, and again, uh, for those of you um, who don't remember, the pink is the highest quality habitat. That's the top 15% of um, each habitat type within the state. So some uh, good quality habitats here in Tufton Borough, some of those are already uh, protected. The green is um, highest ranked habitats in the region. So that's the top 30% of those different habitat types within the region. And then the, the yellowish color is the supporting landscapes. And so it can give us a, a different way to, to look at the community, maybe look at where some of our protected lands are and, and look at ways we might want to connect those pieces or provide corridors for uh, wildlife species to move through those parcels. So the next data layer I want to show you is our parcel data layer. And this is under the administrative and political boundaries category. We're going to click on the New Hampshire parcel mosaic. And then we're going to click on parcels. And you can see the, the different size of the parcels throughout town. Um, I will note if you zoom out too far, uh, that layer will disappear. So sometimes you have to zoom in to get that to appear. Um, so if we're looking at, at trying to make connections between habitats, uh, you know. An area like this with lots of small parcels is going to be challenging to reach out to, to folks. Uh, but uh, some of these other areas where you might just have to reach out to a couple of, of, of landowners to see if they're interested in, in conservation, um, this might be the direction that you choose to go. So we're going to zoom in here. And um, Using this data layer, if we, we look at trying to connect these two parcels, well, let's say we want to find out more information about this particular parcel. Uh, we can click on that uh, and then view additional details. That's one way to get information. We'll go back to that way. But we can also click on identify and then click on this unit. And it should tell us. Actually, I'm going to shut that down. Identify, click on that. Parcels. Open that up. And that will show us um, this particular parcel that we're interested in. If we look at this parcel ID, 
uh, we can see all of these zeros throughout the parcel ID. I think part of the reason that, that it's it's set up with all of these zeros is to accommodate the way different the way different towns identify their tax map and lot information. Uh, but this this parcel here is tax map 43, lot number one, and sublot number one. So if we go out to um, Google and we type in Uftonboro, New Hampshire tax maps, GIS. We can click on this. This brings up the, the Tuftonboro Town website, and they have a link here for online GIS maps. And different towns may be using different systems to connect their, their tax maps and their tax card information. Um, so you'll uh, but a lot of towns have their information available electronically, which is really great. So here we can type in 043-001-001. And that brings us into the parcel that we were looking at as, as one of the parcels that we, we could reach out to landowners to connect with them and talk with them about the importance of their habitat. If we click on documents and links, we can take a look at the property tax card. And right here in the top corner, you've got the, the name of the landowner and their address information. So, you know, with sitting at home, you can collect all sorts of different information about uh, some of these parcels that you may be interested in, in reaching out to the, the, to the landowners. You can see it's about 48 acres in size. Uh, it's currently in, in current use. Uh, and this is all publicly available information. So I'm going to shut these back down and we're going to go back to Granite View. The other thing I meant to, to show you is if you click on identify and you click on these conservation and public lands, you can find out the, the name of the conservation property. Here it's, it's nearly 33 acres. It's protected by the town of Tuftonboro and it is uh, fee ownership. So town of Tuftonboro owns that property uh, and can manage it um, as they see fit. If we click on this other property adjacent, um, again, the identify tool, click on this parcel, And we find out that that is the uh, Chandler property. Uh, it is protected by the town of Tuftonboro, but it's held as a conservation easement. Uh, so you can find out about who owns these different parcels um, and, and what level of protection they have from this data layer. So the next thing that I wanted to introduce you to, we'll go back to our data layers. I'm gonna shut off the highest ranked habitat and we're gonna go down to the aquatic habitat. And here we'll hit the plus sign again. We can look at the data for rivers and streams as well as um, lakes and ponds, or if, and if you're on the, the coast, you can look at the estuary and marine resources. I'm going to zoom back out here. And I'm also going to shut off the, the parcel data for the time being, just so we can look at these resources, see them more clearly. But you can see here, where some of these streams are. The blue is warm and cool water streams, whereas the red over here is your cold water streams. And so um, if you're interested in say brook trout habitat, uh, brook trout is one of our species of conservation concern. They use these cold water resources. Again, if you wanted to reach out to, to people in your community that had 
these cool water streams on their property and send them information. Um, another resource that we have is focusing on wildlife brochures. Uh, this one focuses on brook trout. We have some on pollinators as well as a number of other species. Uh, again, providing information about the habitat and uh, things you can do if you have these cold water resources on your property. Okay. Next thing I wanted to show folks is also under the wildlife category. And uh, you may be familiar with a publication that came out in the last couple of years called Planning Trails for People and Wildlife. And I need to, to find our cops brook again. Let's see. Well, I've actually set it up as a bookmarked location. So cops pond area, we're going to zoom into that area again. So this uh, Trails for People in Wildlife uh, provides great information about uh, trying to put together um, trails that um, people can enjoy on, on these lands while having a minimum impact on wildlife. So uh, there's great information in the publication about how uh, as we're walking through the forest, it, even if it's a, an infrequently used trail, uh, we have all sorts of impacts on wildlife, uh, raising uh, heart rates, uh, maybe scaring creatures away from their searching for food or um, uh, scaring birds away from from nests and, and leaving their, their young of, um, open to possible um, predators. So um, here you can see if you're, if we're say looking at this Chandler property um, and some of these other protected properties here, uh, these blue areas are areas where we can look at developing trails where we'll have a minimal impact on, on wildlife. Whereas these red areas, um, if we were to put trails in through these areas, uh, that trail is gonna potentially impact wildlife much more. So it can help us to um, be, be recognizing our impacts to wildlife when we're planning trails and putting in new trails. And it may also inform your decision-making if you want to uh, reroute trails or actually decommission some trails if you find that they um, are in locations that really have the potential to impact the wildlife using those lands. And so one more wildlife map I want to show you is the invasive plant management priority areas. Uh, and this data ties in with the publication Picking Our Battles, a guide to planning successful invasive plant management projects. And so uh, we all know that invasive plants are, are uh, scattered throughout our landscapes and may be interested in, in setting up work days or, or getting volunteers together to go and remove invasive plants. This, this mapping uh, program is great to show where you're gonna have the most impact if you go in and remove invasive plants. So the darker the color, uh, the, more, the more valuable your efforts are gonna be for, um, for working in these areas to remove invasive plants. So these are, are high ecological areas. Um, you know, we know invasive plants are all along our roadways, um, and it, um, but oftentimes, ecologically, those aren't really as valuable habitats as some of these other ones. So this can help you really prioritize your, your uh, volunteer days, your invasive species control, and focus that in areas that are going to have that, the most ecological impact. And then the last map I wanted to uh, introduce you to, it, it's 
one of my favorites for just sort of looking around at the landscape um, is the LIDAR imagery. So if you go down to elevation and you click on this tab and you open up that menu, we're gonna go down to topography. And we're gonna look at the LIDAR based bare earth hillside, hillshade. And so what's really cool about this data is um, if you zoom in, you can really get a sense for where the stone walls are. Sometimes you can pick up old well sites. Um, I'm gonna find a good spot with some stone walls to look at. So before you even go out and look at a property, you can um, determine are there, are there interior walls? Um, on the property that you're looking at, uh, but it can really give you a good picture of um, what the landscape looks like, how it was used in the past. Still trying to find some of those, those stone walls. Let me zoom out one more time. Zoom in here, but really gives you some some uh, good information about um, past land uses, that sort of thing. And so, um, for all of these layers, I'd say you know just um, take some time, explore, click these these layers on and off and um, check out what data exists for your community. With that, I think I will open things up if folks have any questions, and then I will turn things back over to uh, Amanda to talk about um, aquatic resources and uh, a couple of other programs as well. Sure, thanks, Wendy. And I'm looking at the chat, and the first question that I'm looking at is if we have newly conserved lands, how do we make sure they get into Granite View? I'm just sending you a link, um, which takes you to the page for conservation lands, and it gives you information about who to contact and um, how to get that information in. The most recent update, the, the data that gets updated every um, few years by the Nature Conservancy, and the most recent update will be uploaded by June of 2022. That was just completed last year. So, but we know that people have parcels in between, so you can contact um, Granite to um, upload that information. And it tells you on the web page what information is needed so that you can add that. Um, and, um, and then we have a couple of questions about tax maps. How often are the parcels updated if they are subdivided? Well, you know, that in part depends on how frequently the towns are updating their tax maps. It's not done super frequently. Most towns do have their tax maps available digitally, so it's easier to update. But you might want to find out from your town um, or city, depending on where you live, uh, how often they're updating the tax map parcel data. And I'm not sure how that translates to Granite, where all the data is stored, um, when that gets uploaded. So. Um, I'm not sure about that. We can see if we can find out um, any more information around that. Um, and then Marianne had a question about how do we determine the date of the tax map um, being owned and if it's the most current? Um, and who in the town is responsible to send the latest tax map to Granite? I'm actually not sure of that process. Uh, it's whoever is um, whoever in the community is responsible who is responsible for the tax maps. Uh, the town does have their own digital data layer that is then shared um, with Granite. So that might be something that you need to find out at your town level. Um, and I would suggest that you might want to go to the planning office for that um, to, to find out that information. Um, with the conservation lands, uh, sorry, with the tax map parcel data, they usually give the date of the most recent update, but um, I have a feeling it's not one of the most frequently updated data layers on here. Mm -hmm. um, do you know any more on that, Wendy or Barbara? I don't. Yeah, okay. 
Um, and then Brianna, I'm going to just ask you to clarify a bit here. Is there any way to run a report to consolidate desired information to a specific area or city or town? Are you talking about um, like the image you see here is saving that information? Is that what you're thinking? I wasn't sure what you were uh, exactly what your question was. Could you would you mind clarifying? You want to just you can turn on your mic. Um, and Hi. Just Hi. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess my question would be like if you could, uh, within a town, um, export a list of, um, you know, I guess a couple of different things, maybe how many acres of conservation land, I guess it could be as simple as that, or for all of the um, uh, conserved land, could you export a list of those properties and the information about it? Wendy, did you want to take that? I do not know the answer to that. Um, I know that, that you can definitely print the information out, you can export, uh, but it looks like really all you're exporting this way is, is that, that imagery and how it's overlapped. You're, you're getting a picture of it. Um, really, Granite View is, um, it's, it's set up to make it easy to look at all of this data when you get to the point of, of wanting to really interpret that data and, and consolidate that data. Um, that really takes you back into the GIS or geographic information system realm of things where you can query the data and that sort of thing. And um, you know that is how I would look at um, trying to get the data is is through GIS and you you may have somebody in your town that that has the ability to go into um, the granite database which has all of these same layers and um, work with that data uh, in a GIS program yeah because you can uh, I know that it is possible to get those that information you know, how much land or how many acres are in uh, conservation land within your community, but you would need to be able to download that um, as a GIS user. And I'm not exactly sure the steps involved, but it's certainly possible because I know I've gotten it directly from Granite before, you know, um, it was a statewide data on, you know, the number of, I don't uh, might have even been the number of parcels and acres that are under um, conservation so it's there, but it's not as easy to, to grab it unless you've got that um, capability. Yeah, as, as Wendy was saying, you can, you can use the export tool and you can export shape files. So there's a limitation of, the, of Granite View. It is a viewer for people who don't have GIS skills. It is used by GIS users too, but primarily, this is a way that you can take a quick look at data layers, um, quickly and easy without needing to be an ARC GIS user. Um, but it's not as flexible as um, the GIS specialists who are using the, the, the actual data layers and they can do um, a lot more combining and extracting of data. There's a fair amount that you can do here. So it's a good idea to play around with it. Um, and if you could also export those data layers for more information on your end, if you had that capability. Um, and then uh, can you use identify to find out the names of brooks and streams? The primary brooks and streams are named. Some of the smaller ones are not uh, because those are often local names. So you'll only find the names of the primary brooks and streams. So keep in mind some of the smaller ones you might find out in town, you know, what do people call this stream? Um, because and sometimes you find there's two or three different names depending on how long people have lived in town um, and what it's named. But you can use the identify tool to find out additional information such as the acreage of a specific lake or pond. Um, so definitely look into that. There's a lot of information in that identify tool that you can find out about specific features on the maps. And then uh, Wendy, another question, uh, old railroad beds would show up with LIDAR. Um, have you looked at old rail railroad beds on LIDAR? I believe they would show up. Yeah. 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 Sure yep. um, but you may want to, you could actually also turn on the aerial photograph um, and- Yes. Bing provides aerial photos. It's actually not great for zooming in. But if you look at the aerial photos in the list of data layers, you can zoom in a bit closer. And so if you know where a railroad bed was, you can go in there to see where it is and then turn off that uh, LIDAR data that Wendy showed you 
um, to, so you could kind of almost overlay it so you're in the right place to see how that shows up on the LiDAR data. Um, LiDAR is very cool. We've only had that the last couple of years. That's one of the sort of newest yeah. um, technologies that we have providing really detailed information. Um, printing up maps, you know, you can print endless data layers, but you'll see that you can make a map cluttered very quickly. So you have to really be selective about the data layers that you choose. You can print maps anywhere from eight and a half and 11 to poster size. Um, so you've got a lot of flexibility with printing maps. So yes, you can, you could save, um, you could save the file using the export function and you could take it to a printer if you wanted to print larger maps. Um, so you can do that, but just be careful about the number of data layers you put on. And no, you don't need a specific browser for Granite View, but I will tell you, we almost had a crisis today <laughs> because we <laughs> Granite View before the workshop. And I actually messaged uh, the person at UNH who works on this, and he just got back to me now and he said, we're having major server problems today. Um, so if you keep having issues, refresh, refresh your browser cache. So um, this is just a technology day. Um, mm -hmm. So it does, it does happen. Um, but because I was flipping between browsers that Dave's questioning me, I was trying different browsers and couldn't find it online. So um, you don't need a specific browser. I can access it in Microsoft Edge, Google Chrome and Firefox. You can access it in Safari if you're a Mac user. So it should work in any browser. Um, I'm not sure whether one is better than, sometimes some browsers are better than others, but I'm not sure uh, which browsers would necessarily be better. I used it in the three Microsoft ones. I haven't, uh, I might've gone online briefly on my iPad on Safari, but I'm not as familiar with that. Um, and will it work with Google Maps versus Bing? Um, so um, they just have the Bing Maps on uh, online as, as Wendy showed you, but you can access the statewide aerial photography yes. uh, as well. So we can also show you that. Okay, I'm going to just do a quick, um, let me share my screen. Um, I'm gonna do a quick look, we're back in Tuftonboro. We're looking at these conservation parcels around Cops Pond. I did some color changing here. Um, I changed the tax map parcels to thin black lines so I could see it more easy because the thick yellow lines just blended with all the wild action plan data. Um, I put the conservation parcels in red because it was the best color to try to make them uh, stand out a little bit more. Um, so what I wanted to show you here is how you can take this data and I'm actually going to turn on another data layer. I've got the streams and ponds turned on right now. I'm going to turn that off you know, turn surface water off, and then we go back to the Wild of Action Plan map. So you can actually toggle the layers on and off depending on what you want to see. And that's a great way to look at multiple data layers on the screen, but you don't want to print that because if you have too many data layers on, it's just going to be a blur of color. So you really have to think carefully about how you're combining those data layers. Um, so what I'm going to add to what Wendy was discussing, I'm putting on the aquifer data layer if you were to turn this on yourself, it's a kind of a light yellow color, but it's solid and it overlays everything. So I changed it the way that Wendy showed you into this transparent blue layer because I wanted to be able to see through the layers. Um, and that's where, um, again, I'll just take you that having that turn on and off layer visualizations tool is really handy because that allows you to change colors, transparencies, put in cross hatching instead of solid because I want to be able to see through all this information to the Wildlife Action Plan highest ranked habitat data. Um, so we're looking at all those different data layers. And the reason why we bring more resources into it is whenever we work with communities on wildlife and habitats uh, or on water resources, the question always is, what happens if we add water resources to wildlife habitats? What does that look like and vice versa? So this is a good way to look at some of that uh, information. And so as we're looking at these parcels here and we see that, you know, in this area, we've got highest ranked wildlife habitat um, and it's also in this aquifer area as well. So that raises it up in terms of its significance. So it's not just important wildlife habitat, it's also important for water resources. And that is a great setting point um, when you're trying to explain to other people in town why that might be significant because a lot of people care about wildlife and viewing wildlife and everybody cares about clean drinking water. So um, when you can say, well, this area is important, not only for wildlife habitat, but also for water resources, 
it just helps make the case why that might be significant. The other thing is when we're looking at these conservation parcels here, um, as Wendy was looking at earlier, is where are these other parcels that potentially could be filling in the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle with areas that may be a priority for protection in your community, um, whether you're prioritizing water resources or wildlife or whatever the priority may be, is looking at where those larger blocks of, of um, habitat, uh, larger parcels that could help to build on those existing conservation lands. And we'll take a brief look at that. Uh, I'll like take a very quick look at the wildlife corridors data because that's more data that can be added into this, uh, but it's a separate mapper right now. Um, but you can look at different data layers and how they how it all pulls together and say, we're interested in this area here. It's highest ranked habitat. It's also important for aquifers. And you may say, um, let's see, let's just take a look at, we want to see what happens when we turn the National Wetlands Inventory data layer on and where are those important wetlands. Then that gives them information about the wetlands that are in here. I turned the labels off um, because it gets really busy, but I'll toggle them back on just so you can see. It tells you what kinds of wetlands you have, but you want to really sort of zoom in on your screen uh, to be able to see that. Um, so I'm gonna turn that off. Now you can see if you try printing this map, it wouldn't look good. Um, so that's where you might want to print different levels of maps, depending on what you're showing. You would turn the, you could actually, if you turned off the wild of action plan data layers and just show the aquifers and wetlands, um, that would be a cleaner way to show that. So you really want to turn data layers on and off to decide what is going to be most appropriate and showing the information that you're looking at. Um, so this is another way to look at that information. And I did want to just briefly, I'm going to, um, the one downside, of course, of all these data layers is you do a lot of scrolling up and down to find where everything is. Once you've opened up many of those data layers, I'm gonna turn off the highest ranked habitats and I'm going to take you down to the aerial photographs. I'll turn that on and um, I'm hoping, yep, it did load it. So here is the 2015 statewide imagery that should be hopefully updated um, sometime soon to 2022, I guess. Um, but this gives you the aerial photo background where you can actually zoom in and look a lot more closely at some of this um, data and information. So if you wanted to look, take a closer look at this area over here around Cops Pond, might take a little while, there we go. Uh, you've got that data and then you could say, well, let's just take off aquifers for a minute so we can have a closer look in there. And you can get really close into some of these wetland areas. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can look at the data and information by turning on different data layers, zooming in, finding your way around. You can't really do anything wrong other than occasionally, like I do, it's like I went, did something and the map disappeared, I had to recreate it, but it's all the data layers are there. You can just turn them back on again. Um, and you can actually see this additional information uh, less than 2,000 square feet per day on the aquifers, telling you how much water could be uh, in that aquifer. So you've got a lot of good information there. So while we're still talking about um, water resources, I'm going to take you to the aquatic resource restoration mapper. Um, and so this really looks at stream crossing data, which means culverts. So it's looking at culverts and where are the culverts that might uh, be important for aquatic restoration. And this relates to wildlife and habitats as well. And when you restore a culvert for wildlife, it can also be restored for flood resilience in the context of climate change and more storm producing flows. So this is another useful source of information. You do have to click over here on the left, I agree to the above terms and conditions, um, and then click OK to get that screen to go away. Um, and then I'm going to take you to the map that I started switching on. Um, I've got the conservation lands turned on. So I'm back in Tuftonborough looking at the Cops Pond parcels. And I'm going to actually take a look up here. You can see you can turn on the National Wetlands Inventory, similar to Granite View. Um, but what they don't have on Granite View is um, the Aquatic Organism Passage and some other information that you can find here. So this is a separate map because it really is a whole different purpose, um, but you can turn on some of the same data layers. And um, this does also have the 
for the parcel data, if you wanted to turn that on in that those thick yellow colors so you can access the parcel data again. Um, so I'm going to leave that turned off for now. They've actually categorized the conservation lands, whether it's uh, permanent conservation land, unofficial, unprotected water supply land, so you can get a look at those parcels as well. And so what I'm looking at these red areas, what these red areas are showing me is culverts that are blocked, um, that are, um, let me just turn that on further up here. So if you click on the little arrow, it'll tell you that this is no passage. Red is no passage, which means that is a blocked culvert. And I'm going to use the example down here of the brook trout, since we've been talking about brook trout. Um, and that sort of, that shows you where brook trout are likely to be found. And we've got that culvert over there that's a blockage, which is a potential candidate for restoration. Um, and when a culvert is being restored, as I said, it's, it's valuable to think about restoring it for flood producing flows, as well as for wildlife. You need large culverts for both. Um, so this is useful in looking at some of that additional information. And actually what we can also turn on here is the uh, wildlife action plan data. So we can actually look at our wildlife action plan map again. So even though it's on a different mapper, you have a lot of similar data layers in addition to new information. So you can see it in a similar view um, and you can also um, print this information off as well. So that shows you now we've got that highest ranked habitat along the stream channel. We know there's brook trout in this dark purple and we know that there is a restriction at that culvert. So you can collect a lot of really useful information without leaving the comfort of your living room. Um, you can do this in the depths of winter uh, and you can get a really good look at information that can then be ground truth in the spring when it's great to be outdoors um, and looking around the landscape. Um, and then I did want to, um, I think it's in here. Oh, so um, if you click on learn more about the stream crossing initiative, um, that brings you to the background information. And I would not have known this because it took me a little bit of finding, but if you click on evaluation, uh, that tells you about the information we just looked at on the map that I showed you. So this, we didn't look at geomorphic compatibility, but this is looking at how the stream channel has been altered. And if I scroll down the way, we were looking at aquatic organism passage. And there's a really great uh, information sheet that you can click on here that gives you um, a quick look, a two pager, some information on that. So there's a lot of really great information there that you can access um, when you go onto the mapper and start exploring that as well. So that's just another set of tools you have at your disposal for looking at aquatic resources um, and habitats and the impact of culverts. I have too many tabs open here. So just to finish up, I'm going to take you to the New Hampshire Wildlife Corridors map I'll send you a link to this right now. This is on its own mapper, like the uh, aquatic restoration mapper, um, but it is going onto Granite. The people at Granite are busy working on it. So this will eventually be available on Granite View. We'll let people know through Barbara's newsletter when it's available. Um, so I just wanted to make you aware of this. And here we are back and you see, here's the Cops Pond parcels again. Here's Cops Pond, it's shown in green. I'm going to actually turn off the prioritized habitat blocks and I'm going to turn on um, the Wild of Action Plan data just to orient us again. Okay, so now this looks more familiar. Uh, we've got all the Wild of Action Plan data, but I'm going to turn that off again because I'm going to, let's go to the prioritized habitat blocks. You can see that most of the areas that are pink turn green because those are the important areas for wildlife and habitats. I'll take that off again just to show you what it looks like. So these are the important habitat blocks, these dark green areas, large unfragmented blocks. And the orange areas are the corridors that wildlife are likely to use to travel between those blocks. So this can be helpful too in putting the information together about where are their priorities in town. If we look at the cop pond parcels, as we're calling them, we can see the cop pond is a prioritized habitat block. We have another prioritized habitat block just down here and then we have this connection, this wildlife corridor connection. Um, so by building on the conservation land in that area, we can protect, protect the corridors that wildlife use to travel across the landscape. We see the same thing here where we see these priority uh, blocks and then we see the potential corridors in here. And as you click on features, 
um, it will tell you more information. It actually tells you here, without having the wildlife action plan maps turned on, that this is a tier one and tier two top ranked habitat. So I'm going to leave it at that. And this is a very quick go around. Barbara has the links to these maps, which she'll send you afterwards. But we just wanted to make you aware of some of these additional resources that are available to you. Um, lots of good information um, that you can be working with. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, take the last 10 minutes or so of the meeting to take any questions. Yep, we do have a few questions for you. So thank you. Um, one is, um, how do I get access to GIS and get trained using it? Is this software that needs to be purchased? Well, these days, not necessarily. You can use ArcGIS online, which is becoming a preferred way of using it. Um, through UNH Extension, I have a colleague, Shane Bratt, who runs our GIS program. We have a lot of GIS training programs. Um, that you can take part in if you um, go to extension.unh.edu. Um, we'll have Barbara send you that link again. Um, you can access the information um, there as well. Wendy, did you have any other thoughts on that? Uh, no, I'd say there are, uh, like you said, a number of, of uh, different ways you can look at this data. Um, you know, uh, Google Earth, you can look you can look at, at some of this data through that. That's free as well. Um, it, it all comes down to, you know, checking these programs out, seeing what you're most comfortable with. Uh, you know, some of that interpretation, um, you know, you really do need to get into the, into the GIS world to be able to, to run those sorts of, of queries, they call them. Yeah. Yeah, Great. Shane runs some really good courses, and I yes. think that's a good way. If you do want to learn more about using GIS, that's a good way to do it. And I'll yeah. I'll make sure that that we can link that as well. His information. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So in forest group layers, how would I know what each forest group means? For example, one um, A. I'm thinking that you're you're looking at the important forest soils groups there, and um, we do you know. Uh, there are descriptions of what that those different layers are. Um, with each one of these layers, there is metadata associated with them. And um, I think some of that Granite View introduction gets you to uh, where that may, metadata is, but that gives you some background. Um, oftentimes it will tell you what year the data was, was produced, um, but it should also give you descriptions of that, that information. Yes, you Great. can get that through the data layers by um, going into the detail of the data layers where we're turning things on and off. You can get the metadata, which is basically the descriptive summary um, to get more of that information. Awesome, thanks. All right, so in the typography layer, is there a way to find out the elevation of each mountain? I would say you'd be, it'd be more efficient to go into your, um, your seven and a half uh, degree quad um, topographic maps. And uh, I believe you can access those also under topography. Um, I will often layer that layer, change the transparency a bit and put it over an aerial photograph to, um, to look at, at the topography as well as the aerial imagery, but that will give you the, the um, elevation. Yeah. So, and I'm just I'm putting you over here, as you can see I've highlighted elevation. You can actually, the LIDAR data has two foot contours. So you can get information there, or you could get information on the topography uh, map here, which is um, a better data layer to use. It's got a little bit more detail than the, um, the old USGS topographic maps. Um, so you've got a couple of different options here to look at that elevation data. Um, and so you can get a lot of information off that. Uh, through using identify tool and using some of the detailed information and zooming in on the map, it will give you more of that data and information. Great. All right. One another question: um, Can you save your work and come back to it? You can save your work if you are using ArcGIS online. To come back to it, you need to be um, signed up for ArcGIS online. Anybody can sign up. Um, and then it'll save it to your ArcGIS online account. So it doesn't save it on the server itself. Um, 
so and then the alternative, as we mentioned earlier, is you can export data layers um, to if you're a GIS user to save the GIS system. But you, I would suggest you explore ArcGIS online because that's an easy way to um, access the information. Great. All right. When when reading NRIs, how is the percent of various groups determined? For example, percent of acres of various forest blocks. So. I'm going to actually refer back to the Wildlife Action Plan data because we actually have that information on the New Hampshire Fish and Game website where you can go and see for all the habitat, wildlife habitats. They actually provide you with the information on the acreages of each of those habitats. Um, when you're looking at other data layers, it's, um, that's where you really need to have the, the GIS end of things to get all of that information for percentage of different groups. Um, so some data layers like the Wild Action Plan Habitats map, and you can get the percentage of those habitats in town and the percentage of highest ranked habitats. Um, but it, it does vary. So, you know, if you want to know, well, what do we have? How many acres of aquifer do we have in town, for example? You would need to um, be a GIS user or have a GIS user extract that information for you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, How's the New Hampshire Aquatic Restoration Mapper related to the SADES, S-A-D-E-S. Oh, yeah, that's the stream assessment um, data layer. It uses it. It draws on that stream assessment data layer. It is part of it. So okay. it's all interconnected on the aquatic re restoration mapper. Great. All right. What animals are in the tier one habitat? So, you know, tier one refers to the habitat itself. It really depends um, a lot on um, what the habitat is. So um, it doesn't, it's not really related to tier one. Tier one looks at, you know, where are the areas of the very best habitat in the state that uh, there may be some uh, threatened or endangered species there. There's um, not a lot of fragmentation and development necessarily, or it could be along a stream channel, water course. Um, but this, um, this is the, what Wendy just opened up here is the um, New Hampshire Fish and Game site where you can zoom into your town and you can look at the habitat map, the highest ranked habitats map, and then you click on the species data is where you can get that information, which species you are likely to find in each habitat in town. So that's where you'll find that species specific information. So you want to peel back the tier one, the pink layers, you want to look at the habitats underneath that to see what species might be there. Hopefully that answers that question. Yes, great, thanks. And then I guess we can wrap up. We have a, cu a couple tips here um, from our, our participants. So if you have some knowledge of GIS, there's a free open source software available. I use the one called QGIS. And that was from Colleen and Mary Ann says conservation commissions can get a license for ArcGIS from the estuary relatively inexpensive because of being a, mun a municipality um, a as a nonprofit. So, um, so yeah. it, it could, you know, if you really want to dig into this, it's certainly worth um, checking out the ArcGIS and maybe we can again include that in our resource list um, of how to, how to sign up for that and provide you with a little more information. And it looks like that's it for questions, unless anybody else wants to, you know, raise their hand or, or unmute. Um, I think I something I'll just add is I have had a couple of communities who were working on the natural resource inventories, but didn't have the funds to have um, a GIS person produce the maps for them. And they used Granite View to provide that initial set of maps so they could be more targeted when they were hiring somebody to produce the larger maps for themselves. So. There's a lot that you can do with this um, as you're planning your natural resources inventories um, or your conservation planning, many different, or you can just go into an area to get more detail on something that you're looking for. So um, definitely this is a good time to take a look in the depths of winter. Uh, you can go down a lot of rabbit holes because there is so much information and the rabbit holes are good. They're not a bad thing. That's a good thing where you can find a lot more information than you thought you might be seeing in the beginning. Yeah, I would definitely recommend just, just going in there and as Wendy suggested, turn off and on some layers and see what you find. It's really, really great. Um, yeah, the depth that you can go. Um, so I want to th thank Amanda and Wendy so much for joining us today. 
and, and walking us through some of the basics of um, Granite View and, and the data layers we can use when we're looking at our town conservation lands or conservation plans or management plans. Um, so again, there's so many great uh, uses for this data and it's worthwhile to take a little bit of time just playing around with it. Um, so thanks again for joining us. We will be sending out uh, the links that Amanda has um, provided for us today and some additional information as well as the link to the recording so you can share this with other commission members if you'd like to. And um, you know, if you have any other questions, you can reach out to me or I'll be providing some contact information to Amanda and Wendy as well if you have additional questions that come up or as you dig into this. But um, certainly again, I know Granite has great tutorials as well. So um, if you take a little bit of time, I think it's well worth uh, the data that you'll get um, through the digging. So everybody have a great afternoon. Thanks for joining us and we'll we'll see you back here in a couple of weeks for um, I think some trail funding ideas um, is coming up in our next lunch and learn. All right. Thanks, Thanks again. Everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.